right, everyone, we're back with another episode of Definitely Not Developer Commentary. My name is Mike. I'm Tony. And we're we're here on uh, at, at what what was the name of this place? Uh, this Zerkies. planet is yeah, it's at Zerkies. I don't know what the name of the planet is. Scar Stew Debris Field. Yes, I think we talked about Scar Stew being a very ratchet and clanky sort of name. Yeah, for yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, so uh, I think we just beat. We just beat the nefarious boss fight and did a little bit of arena, and uh, I think we're off to the next uh, next planet. And now we have to get to Rivet's home planet before Doctor Nefarious does, even though he teleported there. So I don't think we're going to succeed. So the pirate base that we have to rescue Cap Captain Quantum. Yes, and is that go for it? Yeah, let's do it. I think this is also the last level I'm going to be playing before we hand the controller back over to Mike. Oh. I hope you're all quaking in your boots. <laughs> the age of reasonable, uh, reasonable gameplay is going out the window. Is it just me, or are there more of those things now? I fear the dimensional cataclysm is getting worse. Well, the sooner we find Pierre, the sooner we can get to fixing all of this. Somehow, we will find a way, like always. In unrelatedness, our door must be closed today for a private event. The execution <laughs> of Pierre Lafayette. Yeah. All trespassers shall be shot and or stabbed on sight. And, and remember or. Article 4 of the Pirate Code. I'm impressed they paid for that song. Which song? The the one that was playing on the uh oh, on Remember, the I can't hear. Oh. Uh, they, had a, they had a license uh, for, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm not going to Pirate's sing. Life for Me? Or? No, but yeah, it's it was a licensed song, which is not something you usually hear in Ratchet and Clank games. Well, it's a good thing we don't monetize, otherwise we get hit with a copyright yeah. strike. <sighs> this is a nice atmospheric level. Uh, the I, I'm a sucker for nighttime levels with neon and the, the bloom and stuff, so... Ooh, a sniper rifle that I cannot afford. Looks like that one does what it says on the tin. Oh, it slows down time. Oh, okay. Okay. That might be fun. Man, Zircon Jr. for a, uh, a See, guy with a See, they even give father. us a nice little sniping location right where you, after you can buy the sniper rifle. Oh, See? okay. It's very nice. That is that is really good. Unfortunately, I am not going to be buying the sniper rifle. See, that's, that's not easy to do because uh, usually we would be figuring out what weapons we wanted in the game concurrently with figuring out, like... The level design and the story and everything. Mm -hmm. So we didn't necessarily know what weapons you'd be able to buy early enough to design something into the level for it. Right. Uh, but it looks like they, at least in this case, figured out how to do that, and that's pretty neat. Could also be they got lucky. That does happen sometimes. It's, it's, it's entirely possible. It's like, oh, this is where you get the sniper rifle. Is there anywhere nearby we could have a little overlook? Oh, yeah. But it is, it is in, like for design at least, it's much better idea to know before you make the level what weapons are going to become available in the level because then you can right. uh, design setups that are appropriate for it. You just don't end up buying a sniper rifle and have no long views. Oh, poor Pierre. Okay, I guess I gotta go help Pierre. Alright, let's finish off this drill hunt. I wonder if Pierre Lefer means Pierre of the Stink or something, because he's supposed to be Stinky Pete. I yeah, I'm not. I don't speak French. If any of you speak French? Uh, can you let us know? Yeah, what, what is Pierre mean? Lefer means? I suppose a simple Google search would probably turn that up. No, we have to drive engagement. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> 
let Tony know down in the comments yeah. section <laughs> what you think of his engagement idea. I won't read it, but please just <laughs> put it down there. That's true. You you do have a callous attitude towards uh, fans in general. Or was that just uh, weak players? Uh, no, fans in general. Yeah, I think that's that's about right. Maybe. I don't know. Before today, I thought the Dimensionator could only bring me trouble. Without it, I would have never met Rivet. I think I knew So I asked, uh, uh, I asked for questions okay. uh, from, from people, and we got some. So maybe whenever you know, we don't have anything uh, oh, specific okay. to say about the level, we can, we can do a question. Sure. OK. Uh, so here, here's the uh, first one. Okay. I've always loved when you guys were talking about the challenges of making games in general, like having limited memory or other limitations caused by old tech, as well as uh, what it was like when programmers would do effects, QA would be the last to leave the offices. How do those things look now? Is it easier to make games now? Did some new difficulties appear over time? Did the process of making games change at all? I mean, a little. Oh, so I will answer the, <laughs> the, 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 the big obvious one, that games are definitely not easier to make now. No. Uh, I, could, I would say that maybe some individual aspects might be easier now there's but, better tools yeah the overall process is definitely not easier yeah there's so much more that you have to take into account now but there's also it like as you get tools improvements that make it easier to do something that was hard yesterday you run across something new that makes it hard to do today and you're you're kind of trying to catch up with the tools and it's also just you know, as the technology progresses, people start to expect more and more. Oh, um, yeah. I, you know, I, obviously, I'm not going to... Obviously, I'm very proud of the games that we made in the PlayStation 2 games, but in the PlayStation 2 days, and all those ratchets, I think, do hold up fairly well, but they're not really comparable to, like, the big AAA games that you see today, right? You know, Yeah, they looked great for, for PS2 games, like... Right, but some he, of the best-looking games on the platform at the time. And like time. we even look at like the Up Your Arsenal multiplayer, which was you know a big deal at the time when we put it in, but it was you know four versus four, eight-player multiplayer, right? Um, and were you dealing as opposed to dealing something like the new Battlefield game that just released, which is like sixty-four versus sixty-four, a hundred-person battle royale kind of games? Like the the standards, the minimum standards you have to meet now to release a game are so much higher than they were when we were working on PlayStation, on PlayStation 2 titles, right? You cannot release a bit of, uh, a, you know, a, a tentpole console game without, you know, a really, you know, intimidating bare minimum features yeah. that you have to, uh, I mean, even if you're just talking about visuals, you know, it's, uh, there's so much that go so much more that goes into any individual piece of the game art than there used to be. Like, uh, you know, on the, the PlayStation 2, you were dealing mainly with like polygons and textures, right? But now there's also textures that are affected by lighting, normal maps, uh, and dozens of other kinds of maps, right? Like uh, materials, shaders, like, um, like if you look at the, the ground here, uh, when you throw out those things that have lights, little cracks in the ground seem to be reacting, but they react differently than on, on the metal than on the stone to the light. And that's all because that's like the, the texture information baked into that area contains more information so the light knows how to react appropriately with it. And all of that is stuff that people have to make. We have tools that make it like easier to make now than it used to be. But it's still like a lot of content just to make the same sort of thing, right? Uh, and you know, obviously, that all depend on what you're what what you're going for aesthetically. But uh, and and even even if you're making uh, a like a, a lower budget game or or a game you know for a small studio that only has a couple people in it, 
the expectations for that have gone through the roof too because we've had so many really good uh, indie releases or like what you have to do, just, you know, it, let's say you have a, a, a simple phone game, right? People are going to expect a lot of things from mm -hmm. it that you have to go in and make. Uh, oh, what, what was that? I don't know. I, I kind of just fell away. I think you're underwater now. No, there's enemies down here. So, I, like, it's it's clearly not. There's enemies and there's crates. So. Okay. Oh, you're not underwater. Yeah. Well, I, I have no idea what happened. Uh, oh, it's the crabs again. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, there, there's that. And then you pointed out just from a tech perspective, you know, people expect more in terms of uh, uh, multiplayer capabilities, in terms of supporting the game over a longer term. I mean, when we released Ratchet uh, uh, 1 and 2, at least, right, we, didn't, we weren't adding any content in after release. And even on Ratchet 3, uh, we weren't planning on doing any patches. They patched in a patcher so that they could fix some bugs, but it wasn't like, oh, it's season three of Ratchet multiplayer, right? right. Uh, and so it's just a lot more now. Uh, you know, people people expect to engage with the game for a longer period of time. Uh, you know, not every game, but just talking about the expectations to compete with your competitors. There's a there's a big list of even just features that people are looking for. Right. And every year we get tools that make it easier to make those features, but also every year somebody comes up with cool new features that become more expected. Yeah. Uh, or people chase after that same sort of idea and then they make an innovation to it and that becomes expected, you know? Like, uh, so it's not necessarily easier. I don't know that it's, uh, in, in terms of, uh, like, one of the parts of the question was, uh, you know, QA working incredibly long hours or programmers not going home, that sort of stuff. I think there's been an improvement there, uh, but it's still fairly widespread that people, uh, people crunch. I, I don't know that people, that most people do that as much as they used to. It's hard. It's hard for me to say, just because. For one, I don't. I, I personally don't really work in AAA games anymore, so I'm a little bit out of out of the loop on there. But also, even when I was making games before, I'm also just in a better position now to be able to say to be able to push back and be like, I'm not, you know, going to work those crazy hours and all that kind of thing, um, where other people are not quite so lucky it's a good point. Uh, to be yeah. in that position. And when you're uh, talking about things like QA... I'm going to die, but I, I don't uh, care. I just want to get out of here. They are usually uh, not treated very well still. Uh, right. So that is, that is a, still a problem. So yeah, I don't want to underplay the fact that there are still people in the industry who do have a really rough time of it because they are lower on the, you know, on the ladder. They're and, still trying to prove and something. Yeah. yeah. Um... So yeah, I mean, I think that's the, so, but to, to answer a little bit further on the question, there are some aspects that have for sure gotten easier. Um, and especially if you're an individual, if you're like an individual student of, or a hobbyist developer, it's so much easier yeah. to just play around and do stuff now than it was sort of back in our day. It was not particularly easy when we were coming up to just sort of make games on your own, yeah. Um, you know, back when we were starting out, it was making a whole whole engine basically, because there weren't any freely available engines and tool sets. Yeah, I mean, yeah, not definitely not as accessible uh, for sure. No, this is probably where I gotta do the. Um... There you go. Uh, but yeah, so uh, there's definitely parts that have gotten easier for sure. Uh, you know, there's a lot, to your point, there's a lot better tools out there. It makes it a lot easier to do that kind of stuff. Um, but overall, games have just gotten so much bigger and people's expectations are so much higher that the amount of work that you have to put into and the, the bar that you have to hit is so much higher. That I don't think games are ever going to get easier because that bar is always going to be 
be raised and there's always going to be sort of people that are trying to push the limits and you know as long as as long as games keep getting more and more popular budgets are going to keep getting bigger and bigger and games are going to get more and more complicated um so yeah i think that, that i think that's sort of where i'm at is just like games are just so much more complicated now than what we were doing back in the day that um in a certain way yeah yeah uh like uh they're less complicated in the sense that i'm not writing code anymore right right i'm not uh doing bit shifting and fucking dot products and stuff like that's not that that's that might be a part of your job but generally speaking that's all been abstracted away from me now where i have uh, uh i have access to tools and systems that that kind of abstract all of that stuff out of the way whereas you know to to make stuff on the playstation 2 that performed well it had to be done in a very specific way Mm -hmm. And that very specific way was inconvenient most of the time. Uh, and so the, the, I, the fact that we have entire tool sets and uh, you know, combined engines like Unreal or uh, Unity and, and many more uh, for different purposes, like it's still uh, the... Uh, do, you, do you see what I'm saying? Like yeah. There's... There, is, there are aspects of it that are easier just because the tools can handle some stuff that I didn't need to handle or that uh, I needed to manually handle when it was on the PlayStation 2. Uh, and, uh, you know, all of our tools were things that our coworkers made, uh, right? Like, they had similar deadlines to what we had, and so it was like a question of what can we get done in what amount of time. Right. But now there are companies entirely dedicated to making these tools that are doing it on different timelines. So like you're, you have people who can really focus on those things as opposed to like only having nine months to focus on, well, let's, let's make tools to make what we did in the last game easier and to, to get what we need to do in this new game in. And then the game after we'll make tools that'll make that easier. Right. Right. But we're constantly, uh, but but when you when you're doing all of that same stuff in house, uh, it especially in in those days where we were making a game every year, it was really difficult to get ahead of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think now, uh, uh, I think Insomniac has lots of people working on their tools and technology now. Uh, but you know, we had an engine department. Uh, I think with three people, and the mm -hmm. tools department, two people. Uh, for PlayStation 2, and that was, uh, you know, that that was, it's just a different scale. They have hundreds or thousands of people now working on engines and tools. So, uh, anyway, maybe I went a little over on that, but the idea is that, yeah, there are, there are some things that are unquestionably easier. Right. And a lot of those things had to do with what made it hard to make games in general back then. Uh, right. You you had to you had to know how to code for a lot of things. You had to uh, understand how to use these very in like uh, novel because they were being they, that tool set only existed at one company. You know you had to learn how to use uh, so many things, and now you can you can get a job knowing how to use Unreal, and you like pretty much except for a few in-house things, it's going to be Unreal. Right. So uh, I got another question. Uh, the tones of the Ratchet and Clank game seems to change a lot. Uh, All for One and the 216 reimagining seem to have fun with storytelling, like a parody. Games like Ratchet Gladiator or Ratchet 2 and 3 seem to have a dark story, uh, along with some of the future games. Rift Apart seems sort of in between. Uh, how do people decide on the game's tone and art style? Uh, so... That's something that I don't have a lot of insight to as a designer, uh, but I could answer in general. What do, what do you what do you know about that, Tony? I don't know a lot, so I'll let you give it, get a crack, and like maybe I can uh, add some color from what I've from what I've seen. So there's different ways, uh, and I imagine that the different ways have to do with the final product. Uh, 
In the case of, uh, of something like Deadlocked, we knew from the start that what we wanted to do was to tell a more serious story that had uh, more serious stakes than some of the things we did in the past. Because normally the, the uh, I say normally, for the, the, the other three Ratchet games we had made at that time, it was sort of like, oh, okay, uh, wacky mad scientist creates a device that will blow up universe done, right? Like, that was sort of what we were doing. Uh, the, we weren't thinking as much about the story as, as we were about, like, what happens. Does that make sense? Um, so, like, uh, uh, on Ratchet 1, 2, and 3, uh, generally we would come up with the levels and kind of what happened in the levels, and then we would come up with a story that tied them all together. Uh, but we know... Uh, I don't think I'm doing a very good job of answering this one. Yeah, I'm, so I think, I think a lot of it, what it comes down to... I think a lot of those decisions, quite honestly, aren't really a game-to-game -game decision. Like, a lot of that is really based on the studio. Like, if you look at Insomniac games... Most of their games, by and large, are a bit more lighthearted in tone. Um, even even when they reach outside of the Ratchet and Clank franchise, you have things like Sunset Overdrive. Spider Man is, I think, a very has a very good story with a lot of emotional heft to it, but it is still a fairly lighthearted game. It's Spider Man swinging around, you do that kind of stuff. I think Insomniac just excels at those kind of stories, and that's sort of what they do. You take this up as opposed to something like Naughty Dog, who definitely started off uh, doing. Uh, wait, there's this is an interesting challenge here. Uh, I don't know if I need to be listening to pay attention to this. Um, I'll come back to this, but this looks like it's something I need to pay attention to. Listen to our shanty carefully and shoot the pirates in order to sing it back. Me hearties, sing shanties. Oh, it's Simon. Hearties. Yeah. All right. So I do have to pay attention. I love the confetti. Pardon? I hope your memory be sharp. Of girls in respectable positions of power. Positions of power. Music to me. <laughs> now everyone, I that be the spirit who linger by the shore. Who linger by? That's pretty good. I like that. As far as mini games go, you can do a lot worse. Yeah. This reminds me a lot of uh, the tip that Gavin gave us very early on in our career. Uh, if you can't make it fun, make it funny. Yes. It's a very simple game, but there's a lot of flavor and color to that, and it's I enjoyed it. I like doing it, even though it's not particularly complicated. They did a good job. I've also heard if you can't make it fun, make it easy. Yeah, Which and this was fairly easy. And then but it was also fun. Yeah, I'm not saying it wasn't fun. Uh, and then the, there was uh, Jason. Uh, he's uh, J oh, why can't I remember Jason's last name? Jason Skiles. Skiles, thank you. Uh, he said, uh, "While not fun, chickens plus plus." <laughs> and I think he's right. Uh, I think that over time the Ratchet games have proved him right in terms of uh, how funny chickens were. Uh, so what were you saying regarding the... Uh, so I was saying, like, so even Naughty Dog started off with some lighthearted, you know, games, similar to what Insomniac, but they've transitioned as a studio to telling heavier, sort of deeper, sort of m more mature stories. Even something like Uncharted is not, you know, it's not as uh, 
as crazy as something like Last of Us. But at the same time, you can tell that Naughty Dog as a studio has sort of drifted into that sort of dramatic storytelling thing. And those are the stories that they're really sort of excelling at and telling. And I think that kind of goes across the board. Sony Santa Monica is a studio that tells very specific kinds of stories. Um, you know, call, the Call of Duty games and those all studios that make the Call of Duty games, they're very specific kind of stories and they develop teams that are very good at telling those kind of stories. Making, just making a story that's a comedy is a lot different than making a story that's a drama. And you different need to have a team set. behind you that knows how to make those kind of games. So it's not the kind of thing mo uh, most studios don't have the ability to make games that run the gamut towards all sorts of things. And they, the studios kind of build up and get really good at telling a specific kind of story, and they tend to make games in that, in that vein, for better or for worse, is sort of how I think it goes. And I, I think a lot of it just comes down to the kind of team that you have built, the kind of games that your team is sort of good at making. Um, I, think those, I think that's what sort of really, that, that's what really drives, I think, these story um, sort of things. And the, the, the people at, 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 at a company at any given time are different than, like for example, the just the physical people who made Ratchet and Clank 2, it's a different group than the people who made Spider-Man. Right. Uh, and the the overall soup that their that 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 team makes together is going to be flavored based on who's in the team. Well, that's a gross metaphor, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, like it. Uh, it has a lot to do with who's on the team and what they want to do, and that changes over time. And so, you know, like, uh, uh, I think that the, the, the team that was working on any of those games that you mentioned uh, uh, in the question uh, were, there's just different people who wanted to tell a different kind of story. And you know, sometimes maybe it's a reaction to what you've been doing, uh, like, Oh, we've made a lot of s stories that were kind of slapsticky. Uh, why don't we try working on a serious one, right? Like for Deadlock. Right. Uh, it could also be a reaction to market trends. Uh, like I know, um, I remember hearing that uh, Jack and Daxter came out in a post Grand Theft Auto world, right? Uh -huh. uh, whereas Crash came out in a pre Grand Theft Auto world, and so Jack One was very much in that, that sense that, that uh, it was very much like Crash, a little more lighthearted. They were trying to tell a much deeper story than they had in Crash, and, th and they did. Uh, but the, I, I think the sense that the team got was that, okay, in a post-Grand Theft Auto world, people want more serious stories. And so they started, even in Jack, to start telling more serious stories. Uh, so there's, you know, the, on the one hand, it's like, what... What do you want to make? What what does the team that you have? What are they good at making? And then also like, uh, what what do you need to make in terms of uh, like what the market is looking for? Right. Uh, so there's all kinds of things that can go into it. But if you're if you're asking like how it happens, uh, you know like some people get together in a room and they make they make that decision, right? It's it's. Uh, uh, it's different at every company who's involved in that. Yeah. Uh, in some companies, it's a small group of people, uh, creative directors or uh, other big stakeholders. Sometimes it's uh, business people making that decision. Sometimes it's, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's all kinds of different people who can make a decision about what the tone will be for a game and why. And I think that sort of explains why different games might be flavored differently, but also why games that are made by the same studios might feel the same over time uh, is that they're all, all of those factors are coming in uh, uh, in favor of either keeping it or shifting it. Right. You did a lot better answering that question than I did. <sighs>